Uh, you hear this all the time, but you know, we, we definitely have to make sure we, we continue to remind you because all the things that we're seeing happen, you know, from, uh, you know, the COVID outbreak and how that disproportionately impacts communities of color um, to seeing how police brutality and police violence is now being met with resistance from people. Um, all of that is being led by youth and by young people. And it's important that we continue to positively like enforce this and make sure that we, we make it clear that you are gonna be the, the, the people that are creating this, these solutions. Um, the Senator said, you know, it's important that we realize that the future is gonna be women, the future is gonna be people of color and, you know, Right now, it's, it's our time to reclaim um, that narrative and create our own narrative that can help our people. Um, in my role as a student trustee, I always try to you know, make sure that it's not only about a one person or one position, but it's about who we can bring along and who we can uplift. And it's important that like, you, know, you continue to maintain these connections that you have with everyone that you work with in all these spaces and make sure that you, you continue to bring everyone along in the future you may find an opportunity that may be good for Jessica to fit in because she has experience with voter awareness. And um, Jessica may find an opportunity that may be good for me because I am very passionate about educational equity and policy. Um, and you know, we, we need to make sure that as young people and as people of color, we're, we're doing everything that we can to, to help each other um, because you know we're put in a society that isn't created by us and constructed by us to help us and to uplift us. So we have to figure out how to do that for each other. And I, and I think that um, I know we have a, a lot of questions to get through today. Um, so I'm gonna start to come down here and I know Jessica's gonna fill in anywhere that I missed off and, and come with a lot of energy that she has. Um, and I'd like to say that it's important that we continue to be like lifelong learners um, because just in these couple of Zoom calls that I've had and I keep referring to Jessica, she's, cause she's really, really amazing. Honestly, like her work ethic is amazing and, and she's always working really hard and she's an amazing leader. And and, um, you know, I, I realized that no matter what position you're in, you're always in a position to learn from someone else. And I think that that's the biggest thing that you should take from any of this. Um, you know, make sure that you're always willing to learn and always willing to grow. Um, so with that being said, I'm looking forward to, to answering some questions or to, you know, doing whatever I can. And I can leave my contact information with Emily if anybody ever wants to reach out. Um, but best of luck to everyone. And with that, I'd like to turn over to Jess. Well, thank you so much, um, everybody, the Senator's office, Emily, and all the students that are here. Um, I want to start off just by saying, um, from what the Senator was saying, that we all have power, and we do all have power. And I also think it's how you use your power um, and how you use that influence that will really change things. Um, when I was younger, I just knew that I had and we all have this um, drive to help people. And as you were reading off um, kind of like a list of my titles, um, I started thinking the titles never really matter because the underlying meaning is that um, I enjoy helping people and we all enjoy helping people. That's why we're here and um, we're working to become better leaders and we're students of life, um, like Timothy put it, we're always learning um, from those who are around us. So when we also talk about role models and who our leaders are, we have to like turn around and look at each other and look at other students, other people who are in the room, um, because there are people who have been disenfranchised, whose voices haven't been heard or have been silenced. Um, and also knowing when to talk and when to listen. Um, so those are just some skills that I wanna mention to you guys as you go on from this graduation um, into college or into a new position or into volunteering, that kind of stuff. Um, and also just um, finding where you are and who's around you, like I mentioned. Um, if you're in a classroom, how can you help the people in that classroom? If I have information, I'm always that person at events. Um, at the end, when I meet those people that I've met, and I make those connections, I say, well, what are you kind of looking for? I'm a very big opportunities person. So I always kind of know um, where to guide people. That's my thing. Um, so if people are interested in a certain field, I can tell them you should check out uh, these organizations, talk to these people um, so that they can also make a change. So find opportunity with helping others also um, and using what you've learned to teach others and also just listen. Listening is a great way to learn um, and not always just talking and talking. Um, so I know you guys can see this. I painted this in quarantine. That's my sister's name that I painted on the wall. Um, so I think when we look to make change, we're looking to create 
we're the future, but there's also a future after us. Um, so the change that I make is really the change that I want um, in the world so that when my sister steps into this world, I want it to be welcoming and warm and loving um, and equal for everybody, um, especially for those who haven't had that experience already. Um, so use your power, use your power to help others, um, use your power to influence others, to change perspectives um, when necessary, to educate, uh, listen to people and be true in your story when you have an experience. Um, I know this is all about speaking your truth and speaking your name. Um, my story is my dad's side of the family all have J names. So I was Jessica and my cousin's name is Janelle and her mom's name is Julissa. Um, so leave a legacy, leave a legacy of power, leave a legacy of love and equality and helping one another in the future. Thank you. Wow. I am so moved by both of you. I can't even tell you. It's just remarkable and also inspiring and makes me feel full of so much hope because um, you are going to lead in, and you already are. And that is just, we are, we are so lucky to be in your presence, both of you really. So thank you. And I want you to know that. Um, we're going to move on now to a presentation um, from our census representative, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, are you ready to give us a presentation on what the census is, why it is so important, why do people keep saying, fill out your census, it only takes five minutes, do it online, send it in the mail, do all these things. What is the deal with the census? Can you tell us? So thank you for asking, Senator. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here this afternoon. The census is really important. The census is right now we have $650 billion at stake, $650 billion. Uh, and that is money that gets allocated to social services programs, to infrastructure, to education, to our neighborhoods. And so that is money that we desperately need in our community, considering that our city was the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. We need that money. We need those programs to be funded. We need that money into our hospitals and our schools and in our transportation and every facet of our communal life, we need that. The census also impacts our seats in Congress. It impacts our representation. Uh, we are, if, if we continue down the road that we're going, we're gonna lose two seats in Congress. And those are two seats that are vitally, incredibly important considering the season that we're in, the climate that we're in, election season is around the corner. We need representation. We need our people to be in positions of power and in decision-making to be our voices in those, in those rooms. And so the, the census is vastly important. It impacts those two things. The census is important because it, it, the census data is what determines the, um, the information in regards to the equity in regards to funding, in regards to the breakdown of resources and funding throughout our communities, particularly in the black and brown communities. So the census data is incredibly important. When you think about, uh, I always use the example when it comes to the Bronx of the two neighborhoods, Riverdale and Woodlawn, or Riverdale and Wakefield. Riverdale came in at 71% in 2010, and Woodlawn came in at, at 40%. So you look at those two different communities and you look at where the resources went and where it didn't go to. And so it is very important that people fill out the census. A um, Couple of things that it's important to know about the census, Title 13. Title 13 protects your information. Title 13 is something that a lot of community members, when I go throughout the Bronx and I talk to different organizations and I talk to different groups, everyone asks me, how do I know that this is safe? How do I know that my citizenship status is protected? How do I know that I have six people living in a room um, when the lease is only for two people? How do I know that my information is protected from ICE, from the FBI, from the president, from everyone? And we, we let them know Title 13. Title 13 protects people's information. It has been in place for the last 22 years, 22 censuses. It's never been broken. The law has, no one's ever broken that law. Um, and it is punishable by five years in prison. And so the census is important because it impacts all those things. It's protected by Title 13. Right now, during the period of coronavirus, they were in a lot of conversation has been around the fact that we don't have enough resources. We don't, we don't have enough resources in our hospitals to meet the need of all these things that were brought on by the pandemic. That is what we're hoping to get fixed for the next time, for the next decade. That if we have something like this again, because we've responded to the census in such a powerful way, this allows us to have the resources we need. The census is a great opportunity for organizing. 
Um, for a lot of you, congratulations that are graduating. For a lot of you that are that are going to start to look into ways to organize and mobilize your communities and and rally around a cause. This is an important cause to galvanize around. This is an important cause to organize around. This is an important cause to talk to your family members about. Talk to your aunts and uncles, your 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 friends. Put it on your social media. Um, we have so many things going on. We have ads with Cardi B. We have ads with Alicia Keys. Talk to talk to people about this. This is really important. You can do. You can play a pivotal role in ensuring your neighborhood gets the funding by even just sharing something on social media. I'm just going to share two links on our chat. Um, one is for our family and friends program that we're currently running. Um, and, it, and it's basically a, a campaign to get your family involved and your friends involved. And the second one, we are actually in the middle of a campaign with Seamless. And so in our partnership with Seamless, we're, we're trying to give out to New Yorkers $1,000 gift cards. Um, if for, for those that fill out the census. And so, as you know, there's a lot of issues going around uh, the moment in regards to food. People need food. And so we want to make it accessible for folks by giving them $1,000 gift cards for Seamless. It's a contest we're currently running. And so we're hoping that, that folks can get that. And so that is kind of where we are on the census. That is kind of where, uh, um, where the need is. We definitely need more folks to galvanize around this. Right now, the Bronx sits at second place amongst the five boroughs. Um, we just tied Manhattan. So we're right behind Staten Island. And so with your help and your, and your organizing, we hope to eclipse that and, and end up in first place. Thank you, Jeremiah. I think that the biggest um, and most important thing that we can do uh, individually right now, honestly, besides voting is participating in the census and making sure that we know that every single one of us, every single one of our, our participation exercises that we do in filling out the census equals dollars. I know that kind of is an oversimplification of it, but we each represent dollars brought back to the places that we live, which is so incredibly important to make sure that we actually have the resources that we need. Part of what is so frustrating about um, the current political climate, but also about just about the state of New York is that we know for so many decades now and for so long that the Bronx has really been at the bottom of the list when it comes to resources. Pick a topic, education, our schools are underfunded. Housing, we don't have enough affordable housing for people to live in. Um, healthcare, so many people do not have access to healthcare or, or it's just not affordable to them. And pick an issue and go on and on and on. And honestly, the collective of all of those under-resourced, important, essential foundations of just being a human being has really contributed to why we're seeing such high rates of COVID, why we're seeing such high death rates in the Bronx. And that should never happen. In New York City, which the Bronx is part of, the greatest city in the entire world, not one person should be homeless. Not one person should not have access to healthcare. Not one person should have to breathe air in that is not as clean as another area where they live. It's not acceptable. And because we're in this amazing pivotal moment, what we realize is that now we are able to really rebuild a world that actually looks like all of us and takes care of all of our needs. And that is not something um, that I don't think we would we ever would have even thought about in terms of possibility if the pandemic didn't happen. So there's a silver lining to this very, very, very sad and tragic and difficult moment, which is that all of us who are here are now responsible for making sure that leaders like myself and leaders like the governor and leaders like the mayor and leaders like our members of Congress actually are listening and doing the things that make sure that our communities are strong because no matter if it's the Bronx or Queens or Brooklyn, Staten Island or Manhattan, nobody in New York City and nobody in New York State should ever not have enough to be well and to live a life that is one that can fulfill them and, and pursue happiness. So I want you to know that is why your voices are so incredibly important. So with that, we're going to move on to the um, Q&A portion of um, this presentation. And it's going to be led by um, our speak um, students. So if you can unmute yourself, I just got signed out of my program. One second, I have to sign back in. <laughs> um, I just don't have access to my document now, but that's okay. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, let's see. We'll give it a few seconds. Yeah, give it a few seconds because my, 
And I'll just say that Bianca is up first. She should be ready when you're ready. Can you say what you say? Like, I didn't like really hear you well. Okay, give me one second. I'm going, what I'm going to do just to restart is, is I'm going to restart my video and my screen. So I have to just refresh the screen. Give me one second. But if these, if this um, student leaders would like to introduce themselves to everybody, that would be great. Okay. So I might have feedback. Norma, if you can take over. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Norma Vega, and I'm the principal of Alice Prep, and I'm just waiting for Hatal. Um, do you, are you okay? Or do you have, um, you still have feedback? You're good? I'm gonna have feedback. Okay. Um, so we're going to go on with the question and answer part of this uh, meeting. And so it would be wonderful for the student leaders um, who've been participating in speak mentorship to the, for them to introduce themselves. And um, so I'm going to go to the participant list and I'm just going to go alphabetically. And I, and the first person, and it goes alphabetically, I think by first name, but um, so I'm going to start off with Bianca, if you could just introduce yourself. Hi, <laughs> um, Bianca Pena, and I'm just gonna start the question now. Uh, so we're gonna go around and introduce ourselves. So let's introduce okay. everybody first. So you're Bianca Pena. Um, how old are you? What country are you from? Okay, um, I'm 20 years old. Um, studying in Alice Preparatory Academy, and I'm now a senior. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. All right, uh, Mafuja. So yes, my name is Mafuja Khatun. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm right now 20 years old. I just graduated graduated from the lab uh, this year in this pandemic. Yes, yeah, so you actually finished earlier. Um, Sansida. Hi, my name is Shanjida. I'm come from Bangladesh. I'm uh, 19 years old and I'm from Ellis Preparatoria. Now I'm senior. Hey, Shanjida. Um, Sarkar Naushan. Hi, my name is Naspisha Naushan and I'm come, I came from Bangladesh and I'm from Ellis Prep Academy. I'm right now 19 years old and I'm junior. All right. Thank you. Thank you for introducing yourselves. So I'll turn it over to um, Alessandra so that you'll be able to open up for a question and answer. Thank you, Norma. And we also have Chloe. Am I missing some? Chloe. I'm from uh, AMT, Academy of Medical Technology in Far Rockaway. Okay. And there's another person, Maya. I don't want to miss Maya. I'm with Team Biagi. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Awesome. So Thank I you. think we're going to start with Bianca. Um, Bianca, do you have a question to ask? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, okay. Obviously, as a student, a school is on our mind. So we want to know, like, what do you think the impact of COVID-19 will be on a school this fall? And how can we make sure students and families remain safe? Hmm, such a good question. And thank you for your question. Um, so this is actually probably the hardest part of the time right now. Um, the reality right now is that we really cannot predict the status of the COVID-19 outbreak um, in the fall. Um, at the moment, New York City Board, excuse me, New York City Department of Education Chancellor um, Richard Carranza um, has made it very clear that he's committed to the goal of reopening schools in the fall. Um, but as we plan ahead, we also need to be aware of the fact that some students face extra challenges with remote learning. Um, reopening plans 
are really key in terms of being at the center um, for taking care of and, and really being thoughtful about students and communities that have the highest need. And so, listen, I want to first just, again, I said this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. I want to first just commend all of you for persevering and making the most of your remote learning. I, I it, Saying that it's not easy doesn't even do it justice. It was practically um, impossible, but you made it possible um, because of your will to do so. But unfortunately, it's it's very, very hard to predict what the status of COVID is going to be in New York City in the fall and whether it's going to be safe to resume in-person classes. Um, but that being said, what we have to do is plan for every single outcome and make sure that schools have the resources that they need to support students through whatever is going to happen, right? Because now that we know the challenges of remote learning, let's make sure that every single student in New York City actually has what they need if we have to continue to do that in the fall. So that goes beyond making up for lost progress on course material, material right? It, makes, it means that schools also need to provide students with mental health resources and also with emotional support, right? Because this, this period of time has been and continues to be very traumatic for all of us. So. I think that what we have seen is that COVID has challenged every single one of us almost daily. Um, many of us have lost loved ones, friends, our, our neighbors, community members or leaders, and others might be, cha might be in challenging situations that relate um, to the economics of their lives, losing jobs or, you know, not being able to go to work. I mean, it's, it is a collective um, system failure here and feeling the, the worry and the fear about paying rent and making sure that food is on the table or facing violence at home. We've seen an increase in domestic violence at home because so many people um, have had to stay at home. And that is unfortunately um, the environment where um, abuse happens for them. And so we need to be very, very mindful that COVID has had a much greater impact on some communities than other. Communities of color and immigrant communities have faced much higher rates of infection, higher death rates, and also more economic devastation. So it's important to recognize the challenges that remote learning presents, of course, to English language learners and limited English proficiency students, um, and the difficulties also of immigrant families that they've had to face in navigating um, their child or their children's education from home. Um, and that is also not to mention the digital divide that we know exists in New York City, which is almost unfathomable because, again, New York City is the greatest city in the world, and there are people who don't have access to internet. And we have to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen. Um, and so that is something that I, I know the city is committed to working on, that I will do whatever I can to push forward to make sure that we are being thoughtful about. Um, but it goes even beyond all of the things I just mentioned, because there are also students who are the, the main caretaker in their families, right? Helping younger siblings or assisting a sick family member. Um, and that really took away from their ability to participate in distance learning. And so I think really overall what's important and critical for the next steps of our educational um, process here, especially as we move into the fall, is that the Department of Education take action to address specifically all of the issues that I've just mentioned to support every single student and their family's specific and individual need and provide any additional resources that they can because no child should have to feel that they bear the entire burden or responsibility um, because they're not equipped to. That is, I believe, what um, government is, is meant to do. And so every single school needs to be prepared to help um, students succeed through these challenges, whether it's COVID or beyond COVID. Um, Mayor de Blasio and the New York City Department of Education are working, I know they're working to plan um, for the fall and to make sure that schools have the resources that they need. Um, but schools are going to have to take a lot of precautions, whether it's smaller classes or staggered start times, masks, uh, mixed remote learning and in-person learning, just simply because if you start to bring back hundreds of students into or thousands into a school, um, the chances of increasing the spread of COVID 
of course, goes up significantly. And we know that even though children or, or younger adults are not as affected, we also do know that young people have died from COVID. And if a young person is asymptomatic and goes home and lives with older adults, whether it's their grandparents or their great grandparents or even their parents, the risk of spread to someone who is part of the vulnerable population is even greater. And so we want to make sure that our decisions about reopening and the procedures, that they're driven by thoughtfulness. Um, by a mindful approach. Um, and so I'm going to continue to monitor the situation to be very outspoken about the places where I see gaps in planning, to be honest with you, and to really make sure that we have every voice heard. And, and just to end on this point here, the New York City Department of Education has a survey to actually get your opinion, student opinion about returning to school. And so I really encourage all of you um, to go to the Department of Education website and to take it and have your parents take it as well. It is available, this survey, to get your thoughts about the experience of rem remote learning and also returning back to school is available in nine languages. And so it's a very easy way that you can actually start to exercise your leadership skills. And we will put the link um, to the survey in the chat so that you can have access to it if you'd like to um, just you know save the link or star the link in your browser. I hope that was helpful, Bianca. Can you, do you still get feedback if I speak? So I think Khadija is next, but I'm not sure if we have Khadija online. Is Khadija here? Otherwise I can ask her a question. I'll jump in. So as a result of the coronavirus, many people lost their jobs. And though the federal government provided some relief to citizens, many were left out. How do you plan to support people from these communities, like immigrant communities, who did not receive enough support during this crisis? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, and also just as a, as a matter of data, um, there are 20 million New Yorkers in the state of New York that we know of. And there are 1.9 million New Yorkers who have filed for unemployment. That is a very large number. So at every level of government, our response to the COVID crisis has fallen short. The government, in my opinion, has failed in so many ways. It's almost, um, it's, it's almost just in, unbelievable, to be honest with you. Um, for so many people, it's failed, especially for immigrant New Yorkers. Um, the federal economic stimulus checks, right? Everybody got those checks in the mail, except not everybody got those checks in the mail because those checks excluded anybody who files taxes with an individual taxpayer identification number, right? It, it, so that is already excluding millions of people um, in the entire country. And as a result, many undocumented New Yorkers in this state, family members of permanent residents and mixed status families were ineligible for relief, which is mind boggling and unbelievable to me because of how important our immigrants are to making sure that our city runs, to making sure that um, our families are taken care of. There are so many ways um, that our immigrant neighbors and family members are part of the, the, the inherent nature of what it means to be a New Yorker, and yet they've been left behind. And that has been honestly devastating. There are at least um, 197,000 New Yorkers who pay taxes, um, but did not receive economic impact payments. That is a very large number as well. And many of these individuals are also unable to file for unemployment because they're undocumented. And so immigrant workers are more likely than others to have lost their jobs in the crisis. Um, many immigrant families were already struggling to make ends meet before COVID. We know that. Um, but what COVID has done is has pushed so many of these families who are living on the brink, who are living um, paycheck to paycheck um, too far and, and to the breaking point, quite frankly. And I, when you look at who is making these decisions about where the relief goes, it, it's just incredibly cruel and, and not acceptable um, and just unjust for us to leave so many communities out of relief efforts, especially communities that are making our cities and our states run the country and their municipalities. They are the reason why um, certain cities and certain states are successful. And yet when it comes time to take care of our immigrant neighbors and our immigrant family members and loved ones, we've left them out. And so leaving immigrant communities behind is also going to take, going to make it incredibly um, harder 
for our city and state to recover because again, they are the ones who make our cities run in so many different and dynamic ways. So New York State needs money from the federal government. Um, and really, I don't believe we should even be waiting any longer for the federal government to act. Um, how can we make sure that every single person in the state of New York has access to relief? We can raise revenue on the wealthy, right? We can actually increase taxes for those who have made money during the pandemic, okay? Yes, during COVID-19, there are a small number of people, but when you put all their profits together, they make up a vast, portion of um, economic uh, activity in the state of New York who have made money during the pandemic. And so we have to make sure that we're taxing them fairly so that they pay their fair share. Because if we don't, then we cannot actually invest in our communities to help them to recover and to thrive. And that's going to be devastating to the entire state. And so what can I do and how have I been vocal is I co-sponsor a bill that was introduced by Senator Ramos from Queens, um, which creates a tax on currently untaxed investments by billionaires. And so this new tax, the money that we would get from the tax would fund a worker bailout program that is designed especially to help individuals who are excluded from the existing relief programs. Um, the fund, if it was fully funded, would provide $3,300 per month to individuals who were excluded from unemployment. Um, this is the approach that we have to take. We have to make sure that any time that we see gaps in taking care of those in our community who need help, who need the care, that we are filling the gap. Um, I know that the mayor's office is also working on, um, or excuse, excuse me, working with the Open Society Foundation. Um, to make sure that um, there is an immigrant emergency relief program. Um, the $20 million fund is estimated to reach about 20,000 immigrant workers and families. Um, and it's a one-time assistance to those families. That's great, but it's, again, it's not enough, right? So we need to make sure that in the future, we have people who are elected, who are in our communities, who are making these policy decisions, who actually are going to put immigrant families and New Yorkers who are here building our communities and critical to making the city run a priority because they have not been a priority. Mafuja is next. So yes, I do have a question, but I know you already mentioned some of them like uh, apartment and food, but I still want to. Uh, so my question is with the economy not fully recovering and the COVID-19 pandemic hitting families of essential workers really hard. So how will you ensure that basic securities like keeping their apartments and food securities will be protected until uh, COVID-19 is completely controlled? Very good question. Um, one of the best ways that we can provide relief to families and businesses is by canceling rent and mortgage payments. Um, the COVID crisis revealed to us all of the cracks in our foundation and added a tremendous strain for, again, similar to what I just mentioned, so many families who are already living paycheck to paycheck. Um, under normal circumstances, we know that in New York and especially in New York City, rent is a very big challenge for families in our state. Um, more than half of Bronx residents are rent burdened, more than half, okay? That means that they spend more than 30% of their monthly income on rent. So for families who have already been struggling to pay rent, the crisis, again, pushed them over the edge. It's very similar to um, what I just mentioned with regard to our immigrant New Yorkers. I mean, I've heard from so many different constituents who own small businesses that they have been forced to shut them down that they have lost significant revenue and that they don't believe that they'll be able to actually survive this period of time. Um, and I've also heard from many tenants who also feel that um, they can't even pay for other necessities, right? And so last month we passed a bill in the New York State Senate and the New York State Assembly that was signed into, into law by the governor. And the bill is called the Emergency Rent Relief Act of 2020. Um, it will provide families a small subsidy between 25,000 and roughly 40,000 New Yorkers can be eligible for this subsidy. I understand that that's not as big of a number as I, I would even like, or perhaps you would even want, um, but it's a first step, right? And so millions yeah. of 
But this is the first step. And so if this is a bill that, pardon me, if this is a bill um, that uh -huh. you would like to know more about, we no, can- No, no, that one, no, no, that one. Thank you. Um, and make sure that you can actually, you know, make use of this because the worst thing that could happen is that we pass a law that can actually help you or anybody who's who's tuning in here. And then that person who actually needs that support does not get it. So we would be happy to help in any way possible to make sure that the right people are getting access um, to the funds that are available. Thank you. Sanjita is next. Um, my question is, many student work jobs like at their dunk, local Dunkin' Donuts and are at times big support for their families. What will you do to help support students who lost these jobs and are no longer able to help their families because this discontinue affect our ability to force and do oil in school? So this is a good question because it illustrates and underscores why it is so important to save the summer youth employment program. Um, this year, um, we have to make sure that the summer youth employment program is made available to the thousands of people who are your age across New York City um, who need the opportunity to get valuable work experience and make sure that it's paid for. Um, many, many New Yorkers, as you mentioned, have lost their jobs, right? 1.9 million. And even more people um, have lost their jobs who may have not lost their jobs outright, have actually had decreased hours um, been given to them, which is also a very big burden for so many individuals and their families. Um, I know, again, that it's very hard to qualify for unemployment. Um, you might not make enough money in wages to be eligible, especially if you're a tipped worker, you work in a restaurant, um, or your immigration status might make you ineligible. And so, I just want to acknowledge that I fully understand the um, breadth of challenges in this situation, especially when it comes to employment, um, but especially for students like you who are trying to both go to school as well as to support their families. Um, I am going to continue to push for the Summer Youth Employment Program to be funded. I just signed on to a letter this week to the mayor with Assembly Member Natalia Fernandez, as well as Senator Jamal Bailey, um, calling for New York City to restore funding for this program. And so just I want you to know that I understand the value of it, that I have already taken an action to make sure that it's funded, and that I really do look forward to the city taking seriously this call for action because we cannot leave our youth um, with no jobs or no opportunity for the summer, especially, especially right now. Nafisha is next. Hello, Miss. Hi. I was here the whole time. Well, I, I couldn't see myself. It's okay, Khadija. Let's have Nafisha ask her question. Nafisha, are you there? Yeah. So my question is, many of us students and our families are newly claimed immigrants and it has been hard to transfer to a new country. For example, I had already completed my high school in my home country and instead of going college and I have to redo my high school. What can we do so that we are not dealing the potential of a student like me? Very good question. I think what you're highlighting is that New York City public schools and the, the public school system is not doing enough for um, the support of our immigrant students. And so whether that's making sure that students are challenged or accommodating the fact that many, many, many immigrant students need to work or have caretaking responsibilities, um, they are not, it, the system is not being thoughtful about all of you and that's unacceptable. And so, there is not a one size fits all solution. Um, students have different needs and goals, um, but we can, and, and I know that we can do it um, collectively because there are so many allies in government now that are thoughtful about making sure that we are inclusive and that we actually have um, a system that is accessible to everybody. Um, multilingual learners uh, have the highest dropout rate of any uh, group of students in New York City which is unacceptable because it means that we have failed them, right? And so again, in a city like New York, 
that has so many resources that um, chooses to invest in so many um, so many other areas. The fact that we are failing our immigrant students is again unacceptable because we know that New York City is a melting pot that it's always going to represent that and that we should be prepared to provide education for whomever is living in the state and the city of New York. And so um, one, one way that we can improve the quality of services um, provided by the Department of Education family um, welcome centers is by actually investing in more of them. Um, we can make sure that you know the ones that exist stay in place, but also making sure that we expand them in areas where there has been identified a, a greater need. Um, and we have to also make sure that students are placed in different levels for different subjects when it is appropriate. And so, you know, I could speak about this in more depth, but I want to make sure that we get to all of the questions. But this is an incredibly important question. Um, and the bottom line of it is that we need to be flexible and we have to meet the needs of every single student. And we should not be surprised um, when we have uh, this great need or when we are not investing in our schools and this is the outcome. This is what happens when we don't prioritize funding for education. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we lose so much potential when we don't invest in these students. For her, for Nafisha to already have finished high school in her home country um, and then be placed in high school again here. It's just, um, she could already be doing great work uh, in addition to what she's doing already. And we have the final question from Chloe, who's actually uh, from our Far Rockaway school, but she had, uh, she's just, she's brilliant and we thought she should have a chance to meet you as well. Um, so my question is, some of us are too young to vote or we can't because due to citizenship and we still want to make a difference in our communities. So what other things can we do other than voting to engage our community and still make a difference? Very good question. I'm going to name at least six ways that you can um, be engaged even if you can't vote. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Timothy and Jessica to see if they'd like to weigh in because I believe that um, hearing from them is also very, very important here. So number one, as I mentioned earlier, your vote really matters. In fact, it is, um, your, excuse me, your voice really matters. It is literally the critical piece of change, okay? And so we've already seen the power um, that each and every single one of us has when we change the conversation, whether it's with climate change or police brutality, that is because people have spoken up. So your voice and being a participant in the conversation is key. Um, that is honestly under everything that I mentioned that is going to be at the center and at, at the core of it. Um, you also have the power to organize with your peers, right? Whether it's in your school or in your community, whether it's around a bigger issue, what does that mean, right? Sometimes it, when you hear the word organize, it feels overwhelming and it feels like you can't possibly begin, but here's what it looks like, okay? Let's say, for example, in your school, you don't like that um, they don't serve healthy food. This is just a very silly example, but this is also an important example because a lot of schools don't serve healthy food. So let's say that that's something that bothered you, right? So you turn to your friend and you say, hey, do you wanna organize around making sure we have healthy food? And then your friend says, yes, great. Hey, you turn to your friend on the left. Would you like to you know, organize around getting healthy food? Great, so now you have two people that are now part of your fight for healthy food in your school. So now what do you do? Well, you just continue to keep asking people and then you have them either sign a petition or a letter, that's organizing. It could be literally as simple as that. And I want you all to know that you have the ability to do it no matter what the issue is. Um, I think that um, when you look around, you see different coalitions that are building. And honestly, some of the power um, that we have seen really break down barriers and walls has been because of coalition building, right? So what does that mean? It means that you could be a coalition that cares about healthy food in your school, but then perhaps you join the, um, the kids in your school who also care about some other issue like voting and together you come together and you fight for some other issue. That's coalition building. It's, it's building the bridge so that you have more and more and more people who are able to be part of the change and the process. Obviously, um, whether or not you're eligible to vote, every single representative like myself works for you. Okay, do not let them make you believe otherwise. We work for you and that is why the power of your voice is so 
powerful. So, um, and, and important. So because I really wanna make sure that Timothy and Jessica can weigh in, um, I wanna just kick it over to them. And if there is anything that you both would like to add, I would love for you to do so. Yeah, um, I think it's really important to educate and then activate. Um, so I would say, yes, find a problem. Um, and it could also be that you find an issue that you don't know about um, and maybe research isn't enough. So it's also about outreach and reaching out to people who have that information, reach out to adult allies who are around you in your school or friends or family um, and organize like it was already said. Um, also, when you can't vote, it's kind of even more powerful because that's not, not just the one thing that people can tell you. Um, so you have all this time to plan for when you can vote um, and looking to the people around you and holding them accountable um, for using the power that they have aside from organizing yourself. Um, Tim, I'm not sure if you have something to add. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think that uh, voting is one of the most important things that we can do in our society. And I just want to echo the same thing that Jessica and the Senator had said, you know, it's really, really important that we organize. Um, like we, we can see right now, I mean, we're in the middle of a movement, uh, the, the protests and all the actions that have happened all across our city have uh, led to, you know, uh, like a lot of legislation being passed. We're talking about the repealing of 50A. Um, the, I'm not sure. I think the governor also just signed a medical attention for those that are under arrest. I'm not sure. Was that, I think that was your bill as well, right? Senator Biagi. I, I actually, thinking. I saw I had a bill that had, um, instead of civil penalties, criminal, right? It's the Andrew Kearse bill. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But he's so the other one passed, but you know what? It's it, both of them are excellent. So we're happy that it did. They are. I mean, and, and I mean, like a, a lot of people get get so caught up in, in one part of legislation, but there's so much of the legislation that gets passed and gets put, put through and that we all have to pay attention to. And, um, you know, don't think that the only time that you can get involved is at the poll at the polls twice a year um, during primary and general elections, but you can join a community board. Um, you can like, there's so many other ways that you could, you can be on your county committee. There's so many other ways that you can kind of get involved with the, with the system and, and try to figure out how to shape it to help people that like, you know, are in your communities. And I think that there's, you know, sometimes it's not taught in schools, right? All we learn about is the federal branches, the government and the, the White House and the Supreme Court and then the Senate and, the, and like, you know, the rest of Congress, but there's so much things that happen locally. Um, I mean, if I wish that at your age, I was on a panel with a, a state senator. I didn't know state senators existed until I started like um, doing student leadership work and, and recognizing that that's where a lot of our funding comes from, um, you know, the state and the city. And I think it's important by like, as Jessica said, first educating yourself with knowing who represents you. I, I'm pretty sure if you go on whorepresentsme.nyc, you'll figure out on your city council, your federal levels, everybody that represents you there. And then after that, you can figure out at which level you feel like you need to get involved with the most. Because uh, after this, um, what, what tends to happen is people tend to fix and rebuild society without input from the youth because they think that they know what's best. Um, but I know that one of the first things that I wanna address is the fact that in my neighborhoods, um, after this, uh, a lot of our basketball hoops have been taken down. Um, who's going to be responsible for putting these things back up? Who's going to be responsible for making sure that our youth are able to go back outside and, and enjoy, you know, whatever, like, uh, like socially distant fun that they, they can enjoy? Um, because people have, like, you know, been, been suffering for a really long time. And it's all about organizing, bringing voices to the voiceless. Uh, so I, I think that that's, that's definitely important to highlight. Wow. You are, you are absolutely right on about that. And I just wanna say that to close this out, there is probably no um, stronger message than um, what Timothy and Jessica have said, which is that you, every single one of you, right? Right now has the power to do something, right? And so anytime that there is a big issue in front of us, no matter what it is, or personally, anytime that I've been faced with such a big decision, or a really big challenge, right? It can feel overwhelming and, and sometimes it could make you feel paralyzed in the sense that you just can't move because you don't know what to do or where to go. And the best way to describe how to start putting things in motion is to just acknowledge this one thing. This is what has helped me, right? You start with where you are, with what you have, and then you just take one step forward. That's it. You have the resource in front of you. It is you, it is your voice. And then you can begin your journey. And 
I know that so much of what we talk about in politics and government is overwhelming and also sometimes feels exclusive, but this is our opportunity to not wait for somebody to invite us in the room. We're just gonna break the door down, okay? This is the time to rip the door down. We are not waiting to be invited into the room. We are taking the power and we are building the world that actually represents all of us. So this has been a really exciting and joyful part of my week and day. And I'm grateful to all of you for participating in this program. Um, all of the panelists, uh, thank you so, 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 so much. Your voices are so important. And every time I hear you speak, it inspires me again to really just stay hopeful and optimistic. And for all of the graduates, thank you and congratulations. We are very, very, very proud of you. Um, Hatal, thank you for making sure that this was possible. And to my team, Emily, and to Maya, um, very, very, very grateful. And if you haven't already, fill out your census. <laughs> thank if you. I may, we want to thank you as well from Speak Mentorship for joining the hashtag Speaking My Name uh, campaign and summit. This is such a valuable experience for our young people. Um, to be able to have this dialogue with you. I didn't get that chance when I was younger. So thank you for making the time today and for contributing to um, just their, their wealth and experience. It's my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, stay safe and be very bold and use your voice. Don't forget, <laughs> okay, so long. <laughs>